Are you drowning in tax bills? Are you dealing with bazzers, superannuation, income tax? Well, look no further than this podcast. We have an awesome guest today on the MVP podcast. His name is John Saad. Are you looking to start or grow your small business? Here are three things you need to do. I'm a founder and client director at Latitude Accountants. Though we're a team of about 20 people, including our back office in Tarlac, Philippines. We'd work with small business owners in the tax and accounting space that we're really delving into advisory and helping clients navigate that small business journey. Uh, every kid who grew up in Greenacre at some point makes the decision whether which way they're going to go. Are they going to go down the path of organized crime or a legitimate life? Uh, I was down the road with a friend of mine. Jump outside, four or five cop cars rock up to his house. They raid his house. Obviously, his older brothers were in the sort of business that they shouldn't be in. Their mum running outside, screaming at the cops, saying, oh my boys are good and then this huge cop smack tackles their mum oh, on the front lawn pepper spraying his oh. mum I just literally said to myself whatever I do in life I'm not going to go down that path I have to find a way out there's some things in R&D and tech that people are not aware of that they've actually got a huge tax liability after they've claimed R&D you go claim an R&D tax offset you're getting you know 43.5% of your expenses back as a, as a rebate you are actually accumulating a negative franking account balance that means you've received so much more tax refund funds than you've ever paid in tax. Uh, section 100A, if you've got a family trust and you make a million dollars, you pull out a million dollar dividend and you find an, a niece or nephew who have low taxable income and distribute it to them, the ATO is now interested in tracing the money flow to see that you've actually given them the money. And I cannot believe accountants are still put, telling people to do this and to buy the property in their company name. And that is a big no-no. Imagine your investment property you've half paid off, goes down with your business, you lose your investment property. There's something called a bear trust that you set up to borrow the money, which which works in conjunction with the super fund. So that will borrow the money while the super fund owns the property. So by the time you retire, you've paid off your home, you've paid off an investment property in your own name, your business and your super contributions have also paid off your work premises. You're retiring with a property portfolio. What are some ways to minimize tax? Uh, my advice to you is... Welcome back to another episode of the MVP podcast. We have Farouk in the house. We have John g'day, Sarr g'day. from Latitude Accountants. Welcome, sir. Thanks for having me on, man. Appreciate Mate, it. I've been watching you since I first started business. You were always someone I looked up to, so I appreciate you uh, taking the time to come and speak with us. For those of you that are new, we have uh, guests such as, such as John, entrepreneurs, people that are driven, money hungry, successful. Not money hungry, sorry. Okay, a little bit, a little bit money. It looks like that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, people who are inspiring to achieve more. So, John, um, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. Thanks so much. If you could please introduce yourself to uh, our millions of guests. Uh, the millions, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. Now, thanks for having me on. Um, mate, likewise, I've been watching you a long time, obviously known you since you know childhood known your family and i've seen what you've done and um i think you you know you would say i've, I've always been there to say go hard and, and have your back and um it's good to see what you're doing for me i'm a founder and client director at latitude accountants there's two of us there that are founders tufik and myself we've recently had jacob come on as a fellow client director we're a team of about 20 people including our back office in tarlac philippines what we do is work with small business owners in the tax and accounting space. We offer obviously tax compliance. We help clients understand their numbers. And um, the, the difference in what we're doing is that we're really delving into advisory and helping clients navigate that small business journey. Mm -hmm. I love, I love the point you made where you were like, you know, I hope you felt it as well. So I've, I've received a lot of tough love from John. So I remember people say it, this, people tough say this. love, tough love. People think it's tough love. I'm just being myself, yeah. but Johnny, Johnny, you know, Johnny would say something similar. I What's the story? And I was like, I was like, yeah, John, I want to, um, I walked in, I was looking for a new accountant and I was like, Hey, I need to, um, I'm trying to open up a lending business in the Philippines. And John's like, yeah, all right. Um, Where's the forecast? And I'm like, what forecast? He's like, are you fucking stupid? He <laughs> <laughs> didn't say it like that. But by the end of it, yeah. I'm like, what the hell am I thinking yeah. about? And like, you know, he took, took me away. And, you know, I think it's I think it's good to yeah. cut through the bullshit when you're it giving is. advice to someone and not be afraid to hurt other people's feelings like you did to me that day. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that. You know, a lot of people come back to me and they say things to me like, man, you don't understand you did this, you said this, you changed my life. Even if it was back in the school days playing footy, you did this on the field and like not to seem arrogant but like 
it's not a blip on my radar. It's like just something that I'm doing. Like I'm just being myself going through the day to the day. And, and then they come back to me five, 10 years later and they say, you said this, you did that. And like, it sounds savage. And I'm like, man, am I really that much of an asshole? <laughs> do I actually they, say do they appreciate thing? it at that point? They though? appreciate like, it. You know they what, go, yeah, they they'll, right. they'll say, man, you said this and I'll never forget it. It was hard. Like I can't mm. believe it came out of your mouth. Like, you know, because I, I guess because I'm a little bit uh, maybe introspective um, and and people come up to me and and like I just tell them what I'm thinking. It, it resonates with them. It stays with them. And mm. then, but like that's the best way of being, man. Like if you're just gonna small talk pleasantries all the time, you don't cut through to the chase with people. You're not gonna help anyone. You know the best advice I ever got is like it sucked at the time because it all just goes against what you think. It's like you think you know what you're talking about. You think you know your shit, and then someone comes that's done it before, that's seen it many times, and they will be like, everything that you're talking about is wrong, and here's yeah. how you should do it. I'm like. And it just hurts your ego for a second. Yeah. And then when you go away, you settle down and like, you know, a month later or however long later, depending on yeah. how strongly you want to hold on to your opinion, then you actually realize, fuck, they actually knew what they were talking about. But it always sucks at the time because it just literally shatters your whole like perception. You're like, okay, I got to actually revisit. But you know what? Like when I hear when I hear advice from a lot of people and everyone's got a, uh, you know, their two cents that they throw at you. Uh, a lot of the time I just go, it's either someone that you actually take on board or you just there to prove it wrong. So it depends which side of the fence you see. Is that okay? Yeah. Does someone want to prove wrong or just someone, hey, you know what? There might be actually value out of what he said to me. That, that's it 100%. Like with younger guys, right? In our community, we grew up, you know, in the area, Western Sydney. Um, it was a tough love environment. Always uncles, parents, older boys in the area, always, you know, giving shit to the younger boys or making things hard for them. It's a double-edged sword. Half of it was true advice. It was like, this is actually, you're going down the wrong path. You're an idiot. You're imitating someone. You're copying someone. You don't know what you're doing. The other half of it was basically just to motivate them. It's mm. like, if I tell you you can't do something, if you've got 1% ego, if you've got 1% flex where you can actually go and prove me wrong, then go do it. Yeah. Prove me wrong. Show me what you can do. I'll come back and go, you know what? I said you're a loser. And you, you know, I've said to people that I love, really, like people really close to me, people you would know, I say, listen, man, you're a loser. You're not going to, you're, <laughs> just... you're not making nothing of your life. You're not going, no, I can't say this to anyone. I can't say this to a new client who walks in off the street mm. and I, I don't have rapport. But people you got rapport with, you go, listen, man, you're a loser. You're wasting your life. You, you, it's a waste. Your parents shouldn't feed you. You're doing nothing with yourself. And, and, <laughs> and like, it's half in jest and half of it is like picking up on like that, the fact that, that they're, they're squandering opportunity, man. We have so much opportunity and you don't want young people mm. in your community squandering opportunity. And then they take it, man. And the ones that use it as fire and fuel, 10 years later, 20 years later, they're the ones that come back and say, man, I'm sure. so glad you told me I was a loser. Mm. How do you develop that sort of mental capacity to turn that negative feedback into positivity? How do you, how do you transform it? What do you do to marinate yeah. that? For I me, I, I'll, I'll tell you what yeah. I do. I just like, I just think about it and I get angry and I become a bit, you know, spiteful and that becomes my motivation, you know, to prove other people wrong. What do you do? That's a good question, man. I, I ask myself now, I guess I'm introspective on life and, I, you know, philosophical. I ask myself, is it innate or is it something you develop? How much of what we do is actually our, our you know, DNA given in our personality? You're going to have some people who will turn that into, you know what, I, I do value myself. I've got self-esteem, self-respect. I've got identity, which is stemmed in like, you know, self-belief. And then you got some people who it will crush them, right? And I, I think you can you can turn you can sort of lean into um, using, you know, people detractors to motivate you mm. uh, to a limit, right? But for me, it's I want to basically improve day in day out, you know, one percent at a time. I always want to be moving forward. I always want to improve. I don't look back at a time in my life, you know, growing up. You know, you know, poor, uh, in, growing up in Greenacre, Western Sydney, with a family, you know, on the wrong side of the tracks. We weren't the Strathfield Lebos, the builders and developers. You know, growing up where I grew up in Greenacre, you had the options where you grow up and do a taxi business like your dad, or you grow up and be a drug dealer. Mm. You know what I mean? So for me, it was always like, we don't have a lot. Um, anything I do, anything I put my name on in life, okay, it, it's in a way, I'm going to prove that my identity and prove that I can make something of myself. And it's something that it's just, I feel like it's always been there, man. I don't feel like I really have to, I don't have to work hard. I don't have to work hard to have drive. I don't have, I look at some people and I go, I know they have to work hard for drive. There's things mm. I have to work hard for. Drive isn't one of them. 
some of the things I have to work hard for is slowing down and treating people like people and, and, and really connecting with them, their feelings, with their emotions, moving away from numbers, moving away and like trying to see the humanity side of things. I think that might be the, the asshole in me. Mm. But, um, but like I do do that. I do become, you know, I do slow down. I do see people, you know, meet them where they're at and, and do all that. But So it's always been, it's always been an eight for you. For me, I think it's an eight. I think people are, like tend to be a lot more um, fixed in their personalities and who they are and then it manifests in different ways. Yeah, love that. I've seen that in you. I've seen that in a, a lot of people we grew up with. Um, you just got some people that they've got like that lion heart, you know, I just want to win. I just want to succeed. I want to prove I can do X, Y, Z and they go and do it mm. and they go and do it. And some like to brag and some like to show off. I prefer showing off to be honest, but yeah. you know what I mean? Like you're either going out, you're bragging and saying I'm the best X, Y, Z because I've done these or you're showing off, you're saying, I'm going to do this and you go do it. And like, we look at them as negative things, but they're positive things. If, if they're done, they're an, you're an inspiration. If you do it in the right way, you're an inspiration. If you go out and you say, I'm going to build a business, I'm going to go international, I'm going to, you know, whatever, whatever it is I'm going to do. And you actually put in effort to do that. You're inspiring others. But this is the thing that a lot of us miss in the money game, right? It's like, you're, you're, you're actually winning and you're inspiring others because you're providing value. Mm. And value is where the money flows, right? The money flows to the point of highest value. So because you're going out doing things where you're providing values to the market, the market sees that and the market rewards you, the money is just the scoreboard. Mm. You've actually, you've done something, you've innovated, you've shifted, you've changed, you've brought something to the marketplace that wasn't there. The market doesn't lie, it sees mm -hmm. that you brought value and then the value flows there. So yeah, you might be bragging, showing off, proving your identity, doing all the things, right? But you're filling a gap in the market and you're making the world a better place. That's right. 100%. The moment we've all been waiting for, ladies and gentlemen. I want to unpack the backstory behind how you ended up in the position you're in with 20 start, hundreds of clients, turning over you know, tens of millions of dollars from what I hear, am I, am I right in saying that? Uh, we're not there, the tens of millions, but we're getting there. We're getting, we're, we're, we're getting there. <laughs> Let's go into the backstory. Tell me yeah. about the backstory. How did okay. you end up to where you are? Yeah, absolutely. So like I said to you, I grew up in Western Sydney. I grew up in the area, man. Like, you know, it wasn't flashy. My dad, mum, hardworking, they were always there for us. Dad was in the taxi business. Mum raised six kids. Um, we grew up in one of the roughest streets, I'd say, in Greenacre. Like, it wasn't unusual for us to hear like an explosion out the front, there's a car on fire oh, wow. and we'd run out in the middle of the night, cars, another car's on fire, what's going on? I later worked out that what was actually going on was my street in Greenacre was the street where you dump the car oh, and you burn them <laughs> after you. <laughs> no way. <laughs> the getaway car, so there was two spots. Our street was the getaway car spot. The reason why you dump your getaway car in Gosling Street, Greenacre is because there's no snitches in Gosling Street. That's, That's the first thing. Right. Right. <laughs> now, now, the getaway car, the insurance jobs, if you're doing insurance jobs on the car, you used to drop them at Roberts Park. That was one street away from us. You don't really need a getaway car. You just, they dump it, they burn it off insurance job. Getaway car was our street. And the reason was there was no snitches, bro. Even my grandma, for example, she lived with us. She couldn't speak a word of English, right? But if cops or or media or anyone come around, ask like, did you see what happened with this car or this or this person, or whatever. She'd pull out the best like English accent, no comment. I refuse, I, I, I do not want to, <laughs> I, I plead the fifth. <laughs> like she was, she was perfect. Like no one, like it was one of those communities where no one said anything, you would come there. We even would have nights where cars would be burnt out. And if the getaway car that they planned to leave after burning their car was like not working or whatever, it would it'd be easy to steal another car in the street. Example, our family, Tarago, growing up with six kids, mm. you could turn it on with two pens. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. one night, <laughs> you just get two pens, you could just turn it on. <laughs> there was the one night I came home, I, I was coming back, one day I was coming back from school and my judo, my grandpa picked me up. He goes, ah, oh, they stole the car again, judo, you know, it's gone. But, uh, I go, all right, don't worry, we'll find it. Two streets down Koala Road in, in Punch Bowl, the car, the car sitting there, the windows are wound up, it's been locked, they filled up petrol, it's clean, it's in perfect condition because they know who we are, but they knew that they needed the car to get away. They took the car, they stole it, and then they parked it. <laughs> no way. I swear to God, this happened. They gave it a wash. They yeah, they it, that, 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 it was in better condition when we picked it up than when it got stolen. <laughs> <laughs> so it Really, it's just John doing the robberies. <laughs> <laughs> we did have a scheme going on in Gosling Street, but it was... 
It actually, this is being recorded. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. The statute, on li- the statute of limitations on what we did is now passed because <laughs> so Uber Eats actually saved Gosling Street because before Uber Eats, Pizza Hut refused to continue delivering to our street. The scheme was someone would call Pizza Hut and order one pizza. All right, I would get on the phone, it'd be my turn, I'll order one pizza. The pizza delivery guy in his, you know, as a pea plate would turn up, we'll have 10 pizzas in the car, his orders lined up, he'd come to the front door. It'd be my job to say, listen, my mum's not home and the front door's not working. You have to come to the back door and I'll pay you at the back door. So he'll come around to the back door. And then get robbed. And then then the boys would jump in, take all his pizzas and go down the street we'd, we'd j- <laughs> to, to the neighbor's garage. And then that's it, Jubilee, bro. After he was gone, everyone would be in the garage, have 20 pizzas for the price of one. So <laughs> eventually, <laughs> eventually they stopped delivering pizza to our street, right? <laughs> but like I said, there was no snitches in Gosling Street. So we, we got away with all those sorts of things. It was that type of neighborhood, right? So we grew up like that. Um, the first time I actually saw someone who was not a drug dealer and uh, not a taxi, not in the taxi business, actually doing well in our area was a family friend who was an accountant and they had a brand new Jeep Cherokee is one of the stories I've shared before. But I saw them, they had a brand new home, uh, brand new Jeep Cherokee. And I thought, if these guys are doing well, you know, maybe if I became an accountant as well, I could also follow that path. And that sort of planted a seed. How old were you? I was probably... It was around the time of my formal. I was probably 15, 16, and I, I wanted to take uh, Sarah to the formal. And um, I actually asked him to borrow his Jeep, and he's another, my Uncle Andre. He was like, yeah, of course, you can take it. It's a V8. There was no restrictions on P-platers back then. I took it. I was, you know, king of the world, driving this V8 Cherokee to the formal. But that put the seed in my mind. It's like accounting is a career path I could look into to basically get out of the area, get out of, like, the, the cycle that we found ourselves in with, you know, families that don't do too well. What do your parents do? My, my dad was always a, in taxis. So he had taxis and he was taxi driver, trucks and that. My mum did mainly raised us, but she's a school teacher. Right. So she, she was a school, she's a school teacher at the moment and she did that. One of the things that really like, honestly speaking, coming from the area, every kid who grew up in Greenacre at some point makes a decision whether which way they're going to go. Are they going to go down the path of organized crime? and like that sort of life or a legitimate life. Uh, I was down the road with a friend of mine uh, and I was at his house. I just finished playing like, I can't remember if it was Lomu, PlayStation 1, something like that, something like that, or Super Nintendo, Mario Kart, can't remember. Jump outside, four or five cop cars rock up to his house. They raid his house. And I was freaking out. I'd never even seen, like I'd never seen something at this scale. Um, Obviously, his older brothers were in the sort of business that they shouldn't be in. And I will never forget their mum running outside, screaming at the cops saying, oh, my boys are good, you know, I love my boys, they never do anything, they haven't done anything and, and they're like raiding the house, arresting her sons and then this huge cop, man, this roid monkey, six foot something cop, smack tackles their mum oh, on the front lawn and then the other guys came and cops in the 90s were different, they wouldn't do right. this, there was pre-BLM, all right, they yeah. wouldn't do this anymore but and they're pepper spraying his mum, bro. They're pepper spraying his oh mum on the, on the grass. And I just literally said to myself, whatever I do in life, I'm not going to go down that path. Mm. Like, I don't want to go down the path. But forget the money. Forget that we grew up in the area. It's a rough street, all that. I have to find a way out, a pathway forward that is not crime and does not end up, you know, I, don't, I didn't want to see my mum being crash tackled in front of our house, pepper sprayed, bring disrepute to my family and have all those things happen. Mm. Um, and that's when I said, okay, accounting is the way out. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, the rest was history. So, went to university, studied what, commerce? Studied, yeah, um, uh, business, business accounting. Um, I actually got a cadetship at a firm called uh, Hall Chadwick. So, I went and did my, all my studies there. I became a chartered accountant. We did seven, eight years there. Um, so you worked up, you worked the ranks. Worked the ranks. Years and years. Yeah, things were different, man. Like you got to remember, this is pre-social media. Sure. This is pre the influencer age. Uh, this is pre get rich quick. There's always get rich quick, but the only get rich quicks out there really back then were like network marketing, Amway, things like yeah, that. You know. And stuff. Um, which, uh, which apparently, you know, there's ways to actually make a lot of money doing MLM schemes if you're actually yeah, if you do it well. What's that like the? Like um, Patrick Bet David. There we go. Patrick Bet David does it. Yeah. MLM. Yeah. He, he just he sold this company for two hundred million, and it was insurance, life insurance, life insurance, he- MLM. Yeah. So I learned a lot of business skills doing MLM because my dad, trying to you know get out of the area, actually signed up with Amway, and I was a kid, a teenager, and we would host events at our house where 
Um, we would do like product demos and that. And my, I was like 12, 11, 12 years old. My dad would come to me. He goes, listen, they're coming over. You have to sell product at the house. So I was like from 11, 12 years old. He's giving me books, you know, because I got book of the month, tape of the week. It was tapes back then. So I'm listening to motivational tapes. I'm reading motivational books. That's Rich it. Dad, Poor yeah, Dad, all, all the books like of the 90s, mm -hmm. all, the, all the, you know, business books. And I'm selling products. I'm there selling like soap, dishwashing detergent to a room full of all these adults mm. and I'm trying to tell them why they should buy Amway's Amway's products and that but like what that was doing in my head it was like the the entrepreneurial spark it was mm -hmm. like how do you sell how do you build business and then all those sort of lessons they they brought the um the business lessons to my mind to the mindset but then what I learned at Hall Chadwick or actually working in a chartered firm in the mid tier was the technical side mm. it's like okay so we've got the business side you got to, this is how you run a business and, and this is the mindset you need for business. Now let's learn the, the technical side, what, you know, business structures, how you service customers, the tax laws in Australia. And it was, it was like a long apprenticeship, man. Mm. Uh, you know, that's, that was that. What I didn't like, what, what I found that was different in the mid tiers versus what I wanted to do eventually was that they had very corporate level clients, right? So upper echelons of society, already well to do, generational wealth. Sure. They're implementing things and, and, and helping in ways that I thought were like profound. But there's the sorts of things that even my dad with his small taxi business, he didn't have access to. He didn't understand structures. My dad ran a, like a taxi business as a sole trader mm. with all random guys driving his hire cars and, and taxis and, you know, insurance would lapse and then he's personally liable. You know what I mean? So like my dad found himself in disarray financially because he didn't have the access, in my opinion, to the information and the advice that was just readily, readily available and accessible to mid-tier level clients, corporate clients, people that came from generational wealth. They had their trust structure set up, they had their corporation set up, their, their you know, limited liability, all those things. So I thought, okay, if I go out into business, I've got to go back and I've got to basically reinstitute these uh, this service offering for small businesses from scratch. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there isn't a $25,000 per year benchmark to get in to be a, a latitude accountant's client, right? Mm. You're, you're, you're starting up, you're a plumber, you're, you're a courier, you're anything, anyone that's, you know, early on, you can actually get in, get the advice, get the structuring you need with a, with a firm, a chartered firm, mm -hmm. without that mid-tier price tag. Let's talk about some of the common um, minefields that business owners end up in with the wrong advice and the wrong, yeah. the wrong accountants. Do you have any examples of some of these horror stories you've seen? Oh, man. Horror stories are, are plentiful. Um, I would like to think most of the horror stories we've seen are people who are coming in with very bad organizational charts. So, uh, I'd say structure diagrams, really. So, what they've done is they've gone heavy into a business model um, that is cash flow negative, with a lot of debt. So, that we had a situation where a big uh, group of uh, plumbers came in, like a, a, a big, huge plumbing business, like, you know, dozens and dozens of staff, you know, tens of millions of dollars of turnover and things. And they basically had a situation where their balance sheet was so bad um, uh, and they had, they had racked up, I think, something like anywhere between three and four million dollars of debt between, you know, Google Ads, uh, tax debt, um, loans, all credit that. cards, and, and just just, like just being extended credit, right? Uh, they were structured very poorly. In the end, um, when what we saw with that situation, and what we see with so many situations like it, is directors and small business owners are not set up in a way to um, sustain, keep their homes, and and stay personally clean from liability um, when they're structured inappropriately. And what's even worse now is like director penalty law, uh, laws for uh, directors have got like, you know, exceedingly harsher and harsher and harsher to the point where most people operating businesses are personally liable for so much, say, tax, okay, and they don't even realize it. It's not like that you're just going to be able to make the mistakes that you need to make as an entrepreneur, shut that business down and start again. No, you're actually married to that debt if you're not structured in the right way. So, structuring is where we start with new clients. It's like, let's have a look at it. Where are the personal guarantees? How much debt are you in? How, how long has it been since you lodged your BAS? As people don't even know, for example, if you're more than three months late with lodging your BAS, as a director, you're personally liable for that GST and PAYG. Oh. Mm. And you then if you don't pay and you get a director's penalty notice, it doubles. Well, they can hit you with a, up to 100% penalty. They can hit you with interest. They can come after your house. Mm. 
all right? And, and it wasn't like this 20 years ago. 20 yeah. years ago, oh, that's the company, this is the personal, there's the corporate veil. Like people understand to some extent the company personal, they don't realize that how in Australia especially, mm. how compliance is actually very harsh if you're not keeping up to date. I have no doubt. What a, what a, I don't want you to give all uh, free all advice. For it. I'll give all the free advice, bro. You hear me. You I tell me. That. So, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are watching this podcast that want to start a business, that have started a business. What is the most effective structure so that you can be protected or, or how would you suggest it should be started? Yeah, it's the, 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 uh, the question around structure is always um, bespoke, right? Like you really have to draw a structure up depending on what they're doing. So what components are in the business? You know, um, whether there's IP, is there an R&D entity? Is there, you know, R&D is one of those issues. If it's a startup in tech, mm-hmm. R&D is huge, right? Um, there's, there's some things in R&D and tech that people are not aware of that they've actually got a huge tax liability after they've claimed R&D where, where they're giving out unfranked dividends, okay, uh, on profits where the, the owners of the business end up paying a lot more tax because they've claimed the R&D offset. Anyway, that's well, that. I, don't, I don't understand that. Do you mind explaining that to me? Because yeah. we we do R and B all the time, so have I put yeah. into a trap? Well, well, sort of well, yeah. So one of the things that happens with startups is you go claim an R and D tax offset. You're getting you know forty three and a half percent of your expenses back as a as a rebate. Yeah. What's happening to there's something called franking credits in a company. Yeah. That's that's the balance of how much tax you've paid versus how much tax you've been refunded. What's actually happening with your R and D in that situation is you are actually accumulating a negative franking account balance. That means you've received so much more tax refunds than you've ever paid in tax. Sure. Now, that's all well and good when you're a, um, a startup. Loss-making. Uh, you're loss-making startup. What happens when you turn profitable? Now, if you turn profitable, you actually have to start paying tax on profit. And then when you want to actually start drawing dividends, there's, there's two types of dividends you can draw. You can draw an unfranked dividend. That's a dividend where the company's paid tax on that money. Okay, that, sorry, that's a frank that's dividend. Right. And then an unfrank dividend, which is one where no tax has been paid. Because your franking account balance is so far negative with an R&D company, mm. when you start issuing dividends, you're never going to catch up uh, to have actual franking credits to attach those dividends. So let's say you make 100 grand, you pull out a 100 grand dividend, you're already on 200K salary, it's unfrank. Now you're paying 46.5%, 40, you know, you're paying top marginal on that dividend. So you structuring is something you can use early on to ensure that in the R&D situation for startups that you're not left with a company making profit with a huge negative franking account balance. Now, I understand that's very wordy and that's real tax jargon out there, but there's just little nuances like that. If I step back and I move away from the startup space, um, you've obviously got like the corporate structure, okay? And then you've got shareholders, okay? Often, More often than not, People are not utilizing family trusts where they need to to own the shareholdings of their trading companies. In the case that when they do make dividends, they have tax streaming options, right? What's, what's tax streaming? Like? Sure. So, if you actually have a company and you have a shareholder, you can have an individual shareholder, mm-hmm. you can have other companies own the shares or you can have something which is, a, which is a trust own those shares. If you have a family trust and you're, it's discretionary in nature, that means you have the discretion to distribute profits of that company to anyone in your family group, okay, depending on the most like uh, on their tax rates mm. to, to utilize the best tax benefits. Now, uh, a lot of people have been scared of trust in recent years because um, there's something called uh, sec- uh, Section 100A that came out about two, three years ago when the Labor government got in. They said, we're going to pay attention to people who use family trust because we don't want reciprocal arrangements. What that means is if you've got a family trust and you make a million dollars, you pull out a million dollar dividend and you find a niece or nephew who have low taxable income and distribute it to them, the ATO is now interested in tracing the money flow to see that you've actually given them the money. Right. And that it doesn't come back to you? And if it comes back, that's called the reciprocal arrangement. That's right. Yes. And then you actually have to pay the tax as if you receive the distribution, Right. right? Which makes sense. Which, which makes sense and it's the law, right? But a lot of people were getting away with, you know, you could say murder on that front where they're using 20 to 30 people in their family they're group. Listing. They're, they're list, listing. They're listing their names, but none of those people ever got anything except maybe a bit of top-up tax that they end up having to pay on their tax return. Right. So that came in, the Labor government strengthened that legislation, which has been there from the 70s anyway, mm. and people started to back off from family trust. But something like in the last month happened, which is really uh, interesting. It's the Bendel decision, right? And this is the situation where... A tax practitioner, I believe from Sydney, um, took 
uh, took the ATO to the tax tribunal and won. And what he was fighting them on was saying that if you've got a family trust, okay, and a company beneficiary and that family trust distributes to the company beneficiary but doesn't actually transfer the money, that's not a Division 7A loan. Okay. Now, Division Seven A loans are a different thing altogether, and I, I understand a lot of people won't understand what that you know what that is. This is separate from um, distributions. But this kind, yeah, it's got to do with family trusts, right? Div Seven A is a separate thing. Sure. So a lot of people would have a family trust where they distribute money to people, like companies. Okay, but if the company doesn't actually receive that money, okay, that used to be deemed a is deemed a Div Seven A loan. So you now have mm. to pay interest on that loan and pay tax on the interest. Mm. The change, well, the fact that this practitioner in this decision has um, beat the ATO means it opens up something that hasn't been opened since 2009, which is UPEs, unpaid present entitlements. So basically, to sort of make it like, to summarize it, what we could be seeing again, which we haven't seen in 15 years, is people starting companies to distribute money from family trust into these companies without actually sending the money, then keeping the money in the family trust to buy investments. Not everyone's going to do that, all right? Someone who might want to do that might want to buy a commercial property or something, an extra investment. They're happy to pay land tax and all the extra costs associated with having a, a, a an investment in the trust, okay? And, and they might be able to do that uh, with the UPE, which they haven't paid out, okay, yeah. and, go, and get a lower tax rate. But we're waiting to see if the ATO are going to actually appeal and fight back against Did this. they appeal? So as of two weeks ago, they've submitted an appeal, but now there's going to be a court process. Mm. If they lose the process and if it's back to pre-2009 where UPEs are not subject to Division 7A, there isn't going to be a company left in this country that shouldn't have the shareholdings being owned by a family trust. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, family trusts are going to be back in a big way if this is actually upheld. So, I've already, I've already got that structure. Sure. Um, why, would, why would I have that structure prior to this new uh, finding? Is it, on this trial? Yeah. So, so... Family trusts have been beneficial for a variety of reasons. There's the tax streaming option. So, the streaming was still there. If you have a wife, you know, if you have a wife, you can still distribute and you can actually send them the money. So, there's that. And then there's also the, the legal, legal, like legal protections of Asset running a trust. And stuff. Asset protection because distributions are discretionary in nature. It's harder to affiliate ownership of the trust asset to a particular individual when they don't have a fixed entitlement to the assets of the trust. Mm. So, let's say you're getting 10% of the profit this year, 50% next year, 70% next year, zero the next year. You, you go bankrupt personally, you're in the family group, someone sues you. It's hard for the person pursuing you to say they own all the assets in that trust. Hold on. Last year, I got no money from the trust. Two years ago, I got 10%. Three years ago, it was 70%. Mm. So, now the onus is on the person uh, like chasing you to prove there's a history of distributions um, and a regularity of those distributions so that they can actually go after the trust assets. This is sort of like the legal side, not financial advice, yeah. obviously, but this is the way I understand it. So, question, that's from the outside in, right? If someone yeah. wants to protect the entity. So, let's say I've got the same setup as well. So, yeah. all my shares of my company are held in a trust and the trust is owned by a company and I'm the director of that company. So, the company is a trustee. So, if someone sues me for whatever reason outside of the business, they, it's going to be difficult for them to come after the assets. That, that, that's as, the as rationale, the right? What about the other way around? So, let's say someone is going after the company and what does that do to the directors or to the, not directors, the shareholder of that's holding it in trust? Is that giving them the extra layer of protection as well from yeah. the other way? In, in a way. So, in Australia, most companies are set up as limited liability companies, all mm -hmm. right, where you're, you as a shareholder, your exposure is limited to the share capital, right? So, if you've got share capital of 500 grand and it's all been paid up, doesn't matter if the company goes down, goes into liquidation, you as the shareholder cannot be pursued, right? Most of the obligations that are falling on shareholders in this country are not actually due to their shareholding. It's due to the fact that they're also directors of the company. Mm -hmm. So, they've been found to um, act inconsistent with the Corporations Act and they're being pursued in their capacity as a director uh, for insolvently trading a company, mm. okay? The shareholding being in the family trust, the way I understand it is is basically asset protection from outside of the business and also a tax vehicle. What are some, some ways, ways to minimize, minimize tax? Firstly, that's a very important question. question. Secondly, uh, you, you mentioned, mentioned investments. investments. Uh, what's, what's your advice? advice? Let's actually let's start with that one. What's your advice uh, for someone, someone that's running a business that wants to invest in property? What's, what's the, the best structure? structure? Yeah, that's a good question. So people come into my office regularly, and we always chat around uh, potential acquisition of properties. 
We have to look at what entities are available to us in Australia to basically make acquisitions. Obviously, you can do anything in your own capacity. And guess what? It's often the best choice to do something in your own, you know, as an individual, in your own name. Your own name. Sure. And, and, and most people who own property, to some extent, will have property in their own name. You've got that. You've got um, trust, unit or, or discretionary trust. Uh, you've got companies. And then you've got self-managed super funds. Sure. Now- more often than not, someone's come into my office and they're looking to buy a property. I'm going to have a discussion with them. I go, okay, you know, hi, um, Kate. Hi, Jerry. What's your plans? Okay, we're running a um, business. We turn over a million dollars. We make $100,000 each year. My goal in life is to basically put my kids through school and to buy a family home. Mm. My advice to them is pretty much always going to be, well, that's great. We want to pay you guys salaries are you going to pay tax on those salaries? You're going to show good servicing so you can go to the bank and buy your home in your own name together, okay? And the reason we're going to do it in your own name is because you get something called the main residence exemption from capital gains tax. That means that you can buy that house for a million bucks today, sell it when you retire for 50 million, you know, who knows what in the Sydney market. No CGT. No CGT. I'm never going to tell them to not you take that option right also they're not paying say in new south wales any land tax on that because your main residence ex is exempt from land tax now it gets more complicated if we're moving into the investment realm so they might come back and say we've done that and we paid off our home or you know we've got a small mortgage on it we want to buy an investment well what type of investment is it okay it's a residential invest investment commercial what are you going to do with it another resi investment it's still often the case that they're going to buy that in their own names because whilst they're going to pay capital gains tax and there are exemptions and things where we can bring the capital gains tax down. Um, they're, they're going to still use their cap of um, land tax to basically still have that first investment property land tax free. So, this it's, is a threshold. there's a threshold All right, for investments. The other thing is, if I said to them, they had two options. They had a company already where they were trading a business or them personally. I get the question a lot. And I cannot believe accountants are still p telling people to do this and people are still doing this. Some people are telling them to buy the property in their company name. And that is a big no-no. Mm. Why is it a big no-no? The company is now um, not exempt from, not exempt from uh, it doesn't get the 50% CGT discount, which you do get if you've owned it for more than 12 months as an individual. The other thing is what's happening with companies every day in Australia right now? Going under. They're going under. And they're going under at a rate which is unprecedented. And then liquidators and creditors are coming after the companies. Imagine your investment property you've half paid off goes down with your business. You lose your investment property. Mm -hmm. I am inheriting clients still today that have bought properties in the last two years and they've bought them in their trading businesses. I don't know how it happens. I don't know how it happens. <laughs> I look at the books. I say, how did this happen? I spoke to my accountant. He said, buy in the company. I go, I don't understand how this, this is, this is ridiculous advice. And the banks don't, don't care. No one cares. No one cares. And, and accountants can't give financial advice. So. Technically, like there isn't a paper trail where someone's written them a letter and told them, hey, you should yeah. buy this in the company. But they've had some uh, like conversation with the accountant where they said, yeah, it's fine buying the company, I've done it. But they've got no recourse against the accountant because the accountants put nothing in writing. Mm -hmm. So, the bank, the bank can use the company as serviceability, but it does not have to be bought through the company. It doesn't have to be bought through the company. Right. So, th so, that's the company option. The company, especially in a trading business, in, in the ec economic climate we're in, is never going to be the right vehicle to buy your investment, yeah. whether it's commercial or resi. The trust comes into play um, as a separate legal entity where you can get access to the CGT concessions because trusts don't pay tax. Trusts are just a holding entity where the benefit of the profits uh, goes through to beneficiaries mm -hmm. and then you pay at the beneficiary level. So, if you are the beneficiary of the trust and you would be you know, entitled to get the CGT exemption for owning it for more than 12 months or whatever it may be, you still get that, but it's still held in a separate legal entity. So, the trust we find is valuable. The thing with the trust, you have to exclude foreign beneficiaries from being uh, in the trust aid because if they are, you pay an extra 2% land tax just by virtue of the fact that you haven't excluded foreign beneficiaries. And that's just in the trust deed. That's just in the trust deed. So, a few years ago, there was a big overhaul of trust and trust deed. They, they got all fixed up. Mm. So, the trust comes into play, but you pay land tax. The, the, there's no, there's no, there's no, um, you know, there's no exemption from land tax. So, you pay the land tax, you just don't pay the extra land tax mm. on the foreign beneficiaries. The one that's interesting and, and, and is attractive and people don't know a lot about is Sorry. buying a, buying in self-managed super funds. So, this is something that's come on the scene in the last 10 years but in a big way in the last five years because the banks have come to the party. 2015, 
uh, the rules changed so that you could buy property in your self-managed super fund and borrow and the banks didn't have the products. So people would be like, okay, I've got 300 grand in my super fund. I want to buy a million dollar property. I want to borrow 700 grand. It's now legal. There's something called a bear trust that you set up to borrow the money. What's a bear trust? Okay. So a bear trust. You a bear trust? No. Nah. So you've got your self-managed super fund. They changed the rules <laughs> around 2015 to say that the super fund still can't borrow money because a super fund can only do one thing, which is generate benefits for retirement. So borrowing money does not generate benefits for retirement. It doesn't meet the sole purpose test. So, that, so the law did a workaround where it said you can set up another trust called a bear trust, which works in conjunction with the super fund. So that will borrow the money while the super fund owns the property. So now you've got two trusts working side by side. One's a super fund, one's a bear trust. Got it. So we started setting up bear trust, but then initially no banks were lending to super funds, but that's changed in the last five years. All the banks have caught up. So what people are doing now is they're getting huge tax deductions for dropping as much money as possible into super. Is it a cap? It's now capped that uh, you can't, you know, it's 15% flat rate on tax in your super. But if you have over $3 million in super, I've got a few There's rich a clients. New app, right? A new, new one, yeah. A few of my rich clients have called me a little bit upset about that because <laughs> they got a lot more than $3 million in super. They're like wiping their, wiping wiping their, their tears, tears with the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're wiping their tears with the money. No, look, it is one of those things. So you, you can actually buy in super and you can, and the most, uh, obvious way people do it is they buy a property for their business. So you might be running this business here. You go buy this um, as a in your super fund. You borrow whatever you need to borrow. Um, the super fund pays it off with the rent that your business will pay. So it has to be at arm's length. You have to get you know rent written and say that this is the market rent. And then your super contributions will also come in. So by the time you retire, you've paid off your home. You've paid off an investment property in your own name. Your business and your super contributions have also paid off your work premises. You're retiring with a property portfolio. Question, what happens if you flip that property? Let's say you buy it for a million, you flip it for two million. Does that two million have to go back into your super or can you take the proceeds outside of the super? Yeah. Because once it's in the super, You could do whatever you want in. with it, like casino or whatever. <laughs> 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 it has to go back to the super. It has to go back to the super. So All the proceeds, right? All the proceeds go back. Right. Okay. Now, the super fund is taxed at 15%, mm. but you also, you don't get a 50% CGT discount if you've owned it for more than 12 months, but you get a 33% okay. CGT discount. Now, remember, the tax rate's already 15%. What's 33% of 15 is 5, so your tax rate on the gain is only 10%. That's very oh. good. Oh. All right. So, it's not a bad thing, man. And then when you retire, you know, um, uh, you know, you retire and the super is tax-free. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, so super is one of those things where you there's something called the transfer balance cap, which means you can put in your lifetime $1.7 million indexed into pension mode. And once you convert it into pension mode, you never pay tax on that again. So your first $1.7 million, anyone worth anything in this country that does, does um, wants to build a portfolio of assets has to at least have 1.7 million super by the time they retire. If not, you're leaving money on the table. Right. Like you want to have a 1.7 mil index. So by the time we retire, it might be 2.5 mil or whatever. Mm. You want to have that much in super so you can flip it to pension and it's tax-free for the rest of your life. Mm. Okay. And then other people, I would say at the very least, if you're wealthy, you want to at least get to the three mil cap so you can keep earning paying tax at 15% on the rest, do you know what I mean? Up to three mil. Over three mil, it doubles to 30%. Now we can start working out, okay, do I want to pay 30% tax? Maybe not. That's This is all the tax rate. All these discussions are discussions we're trying to have on day one with clients when mm -hmm. they walk in and say, okay, what's the vision? What's the big picture? What do you want to achieve in the business? What do you want to achieve with property, with family wealth? Let's draw it all out, okay, as if you're going to actually do it mm -hmm. and then let's set it up that way. Yeah. So, can I just butt in for a second? If a client comes to you and they want to own a property in their own name, you first strategy you mentioned is give them income, they pay income tax, they purchase it up and they've built up enough enough for deposit. Yeah, right? yeah. Why it's, do they dip seven A in that? Why why are you doing it through uh, wages? Oh, okay. So let's say someone comes to me. Um, there's a few nuanced discussions we have around that. You might be a you know partner, husband or wife, whatever, husband, husband, I don't care, right? You come in, you guys have a business. The business is risky. You're a director. Now, you guys might be making great money where only one of you can support the loan on your own, right? You can actually service. In that case, it isn't a bad advice in some cases, depending on your circumstances, for the non-business partner in that relationship to buy the property in their own name alone. Because remember, if businesses go bad and directors don't f fulfill their obligations, they're carrying risk and liability. Mm -hmm. 
So we do have clients and we do see clients where let's say, for example, a uh, husband's running a business, he's a director, uh, the family home's just in the wife's name, okay? The big issue we have and why we don't use, say, drawings or Div 7A loans or whatever to um, to fund an acquisition is because banks, to give you a loan, need to see servicing. And more often than not, the servicing they're going to rely on is your wage and profits in your company, okay? so But Div 7A doesn't take away from profits in the company or servicing. Yeah, so what's the, what is it that you're asking exactly with the Div 7A? Rather than pay, buying a property through wages, you just pull out the money, yep. uh, which is franked, yep. buy a loan. Oh, okay. So you've got a company here. Yeah. You pull out. You want to pull out a, either a Div Seven A loan or or frank dividend, right? To your personal name, and then you buy a property with that money. Right. That's that's an appropriate strategy. If as long as yeah, like so. There's there's two there's two things happening there. One is the loan strategy. One is the tax strategy, right? right. And it's always a balance. It's like, okay, um, I want to fund eighty percent of my loan from the bank. Okay, that means I'm going to have to personally service or. I think what you're talking about is don't use the banks, like pull out dividends and buy the house outright? No. No? You're saying just a deposit? Correct. Okay. So, if you're taking out a deposit from your company, you have to deal with the top-up tax. So, if you pull out a Div 7A loan from your own company, you've got seven years, okay, to pay that off. Now, no one, no director ever puts money back in the business. Let's be honest. Once that money's out, it's out. You're not dropping money back in. Man, it's a tool for you to make money. So, you pull out 500 grand. You now got to pay off that five, let's say 700 to make it easy. You pull out 700 grand, you got to pay out, pay off 700 grand within seven years. Okay. That's a Div 7A loan. You got to pay it with interest back to the company. You're not going to pay it back. So what we do is we declare a dividend to you every year for seven years till we reduce that balance to zero. So you no longer owe the company money. When we declare that dividend, you don't draw out the money. You already drew out the money. It just offsets the It's offsetting. So it offsets the debt. Now, this is the interesting thing with Div 7A loans, and not a lot of people know this. If you're buying an investment, and you're buying it completely with your own funds, you can secure your Div 7A loan against the property and now you become your own bank. So let's say you've got a million bucks in your, in your company. You pull it out as a Div 7A loan, okay, and you buy a property. You can now secure the loan against the property, your investment, and instead of paying it off over seven years, 25 years, do you want a job? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's a catch with that, right? It's the 110% rule. Uh, the, the interest you're paying interest. No, like- no, no, not not the interest. Um, uh, they'll they'll secure it against 110. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, sec- the security, right? Yeah, I uh, know, but like you, you, you can can't still- pull out as much. You can't pull out as much, yeah. But look, there's so many there's things. So there's so many ways. things, man. There's so many ways. A lot of the times, it's not this complicated, man. A lot mm. of the time, people are starting, and it's very simple things. It's like, okay, you're trading as a sole trader, and you own your own, your own house, and it's paid off, and you're in a high risk industry. This is bad because you're now personally liable for anything that happens in your business. Mm. Let's set up a company. Mm. Oh, while we're at it, let's set up the family trust so if we can distribute. Like sometimes it's the smallest things that catch out people. You talk about disaster stories um, like CGT, like selling a property. Make I've got a client who's come on with bad advice. They bought a property in the Gold Coast, million bucks three years ago. It's worth two mil now in a company. They're selling it. They're going to pay tax at company rates on a million 30%. bucks. When if it was owned personally, they would have had CGT 50% off. I'm like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's it's the smallest things, and 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 this is why people are like it's it's. I want to, I want everyone. If I would be happy, and my job will be done. If everyone in Sydney, everyone in Australia would know, you have access to good structural accounting advice from a chartered accountant at a very low cost. Mm. Okay, if you want it, um, it's it's not out of reach. Like, you don't need to go to PwC you know, top 10, five, five, top 10, top four, big four firm to get the simple advice to save you potentially three, four, five hundred grand on yeah. a property transaction. John, you've seen hundreds of clients yeah. turning over, you know, tens, even hundreds of millions. Do you, do you have clients that turn yeah. over that sort of money? I've seen that, yeah. What's what's the... Our, 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 uh, mar- our target market is up to 100 mil because over 100 mil is, is audit territory. So, we generally go to the list. So, we deal with companies generally up to you know 100 mil, 100 employees. But I have worked on those companies in the past and we do see it. Yeah. So, my question is, what is the common traits you see in the way that their accounts look that leads to their success? It's a good question. So, this is a bit of a question about how do businesses get get successful and get profitable? And stay there. And stay there. <laughs> so that's the important yeah. part, right? Because it's one thing to climb, but then if you crash at the end. Yeah. Area. I've got I've got a little philosophy on on getting to the next level, right? So a big part of what we do is helping people win. 
And I'm very intuitive, so I don't know if it's real. I'm a bit like maybe a, a bit of it's made up, but I see patterns in everything. And most things are patterns and they're repeat behaviors and the things we see over and over again. I've tried to summarize what I see as the four real errors stopping people getting to the next level. And um, four areas. Yeah, yeah there's four areas, four, four errors and four areas, right? So the, the, four, the four things that withhold people, uh, you can always almost summarize it to fall into one of these four categories. And they're, they're four people types, all right? And I call them weaklings, wankers, babies, and bots. <laughs> You're the first two. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what, what would that yeah. <laughs> uh, weaklings. weaklings, wankers, You're babies, wanker. and bots. Babies, babies and bots. Okay. Yeah, all know. right? So, so the way I like to look at it, right, is w- w- everyone is prone to making certain mistakes. It's based on who we are. And no one, no one is fully exempt. Every one of us, the three of us in this room, you're all prone, we're all prone to actually fall into one of these er- error categories. We'll either fall into two or the other two, depending on how we set up our genetics. Weaklings are, uh, they're derogatory terms on purpose because they're meant to make people feel like, I don't want to be a weakling, I don't want to be a wanker, I don't, don't want to be, be a, loser. I don't want a baby or a I don't want to be bot. that loser, yeah. all my parents, yeah. all my parents don't feed yeah. me. Now, <laughs> now obviously, if, I, if someone walks in, I don't sit there and say, listen, mate, it's obvious you're a wanker. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but, but, you know, I point the finger at myself first. So, what happens is like the weakling mistake is basically people that aren't taking things to the next level because they're concerned about what other people think or feel, okay? So, I, I think I heard you guys say that, you know, when you started your own business, mum didn't, wasn't yeah. fond of the idea. The weakling mindset in that situation is my mum doesn't think it's a good idea for, for me to start the business or you could be in business. Fear mindset. Fear mindset, fixed mindset around that sort of thing. So often the right, the right answer is obvious. You can feel it. You can think it. It's logical. You just can't do it because someone, you don't have permission. Someone's had to give you permission. And, and the way out of that is to realize, hey, I'm being a weakling. I need to actually level up. If I'm going to meet, you know, you know, achieve my goal, I need to do this thing. You can give yourself permission. Give yourself you permission. Go go yeah. Back. Like for, for instance, I've known you, you know, your whole life. You're not someone who, who struggles with the weakling mindset. Do you know what I mean? Like when someone category. says no, he's like, yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, I don't feel like, and I also if I'm self-assessing myself, I don't feel like I'm someone who struggles with needing permission. Okay, but I do know people and they're really good business people who do still struggle with it. My wife, who is in, like, we need to do this for the business. We need to invest like this. This is the next way we need to go, but it's going to make my life harder. My wife won't be happy. My husband won't be happy. I'm going to have to put in more hours, X, Y, Z. Get rid of that. Mm. Pick, get out of that mindset. Enough about Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one for Jacob. Don't worry, it's not that. <laughs> the 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 uh, the wanker mindset is a you know is another word for basically the arrogant mindset. It's someone who refuses to acknowledge what the market wants. Okay, it's I've got a way. It's my way. I, I value this way. It's the way I do it. I like this. It works in my mind. That's so good, yeah. I but but the market, yeah. but the market doesn't want that. <laughs> yeah. What does the market want? Yeah. The market dictates what, what the right 100%. move is, not you or your feelings or your emotions. You know what I mean? So sometimes it's other people, the, ba- the weaklings are getting, get, you know, other people getting away. The wankers, they're getting in their own way yeah. because they're refusing to acknowledge what the market has told them. Mm-hmm. You guys, uh, and we're trying to really get big on getting feedback from clients. Mm-hmm. An arrogant person is not interested in your feedback. Mm-hmm. But a, a wise person who cares about what the market says and wants to take their business to the next level will get market feedback 100%. and will pivot and they'll suck it up. They'll yeah. eat it. I, I was wrong. I yeah. thought this is what the market wanted. Guess what? I didn't want it. It doesn't you matter. Know what, John, um, I was literally in the sauna yesterday and it was a recruiter there. And, uh, you know, we had a conversation with Ravi where that, that sort of mindset where he was really stuck on doing a uh, purchase price of 500K and we like, change that. You know, why are you... Why are you thinking that this is the only demographic that you should target? But aside from Ravi, this this recruiter yesterday, he's telling me, yeah, I'm, I, I specialize in this industry of recruitment. And I was like, why don't you expand? Because clearly the market's not there for it. He's complaining about the market. And he's like, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like ego, you know, I'm, I'm a specialist in this. And a lot of people don't pivot, don't reinvent themselves. Mm. They're either willing to change. Yeah. And they're wankers. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> they're wankers. They're wankers if they're doing it because they're being too proud or too yeah. arrogant. Babies are people, okay? Babies are people who always think, like imagine a baby, you got a rattle, it's a, it's a, it's a red rattle and then there's a blue one here and then you shake the blue one and they're like, oh, that's new, I'm going to go to that. They're, they're people who their businesses are struggling because they're, they're refusing to focus 
okay? And they think that the, the information they need is out there, not in here mm. already, right? So Shiny what object syndrome. Shiny objects, yeah. they, they can't focus. They just think, or, or they might be wanting to jump into a business or pivot their business, but they go, you know what? I just got to read one more book. Mm. Uh, you know what? I just got to read that Hormozy book. <laughs> and when that drops, uh, then I'll have enough information. You know what I mean? I'll, I just need to speak to one more guy. You know what I mean? I just need to do one more podcast and ask one more question yeah. before I go to America and then I'll go to America. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> but but there's there's that baby mindset where like it's, it, it is like a lack of focus. It's like I'm not ready. I don't have all the information. You have all the information. Like for people like that, they have all the information. Mm. It's just their own brain telling them, they need one more one more bit of info, then they'll be ready, then yeah. they'll be ready. No, I love that. But you know what's interesting? Between baby and wanker, there's a bit yeah. of a contradiction, right? Yeah. Because with the wanker, he's not exploring enough, right? They're not yeah. exploring enough. They're not going out. He's, not, he's not feeling what the, what the tribe wants. He's not feeling what the market wants. Correct. The, the baby's like, oh, I've got to keep searching, exploring because I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I'm feeling not, too much. I'm not ready. I'm not right. ready. I'm not ready. You're you're not ready. It's true. Sometimes you're not ready. You're never but, but bro, if you've been not ready for 20 years, you're never going to get ready. You know what I mean? Like just make a move. You know yeah. what I mean? And then bots, I put myself sometimes into the bot category, but they're NPCs, bro. They're not playing. They're going every day to their job. They're going every day to their business. And because it worked yesterday, they have to do it exactly the same way today. They're stuck in a rut. Do you know what I mean? They're people, it's like... Um, because I've done it like this yesterday, I have to do it like this tomorrow. I did it like this yesterday. I had enough money to pay my mortgage and I had enough money to pay the bills. I'll do it like this tomorrow. They're void of innovation. They're void of basically exploration. So it is the flip side of the baby. The baby and the bot is a flip sides of each other. The baby is always like new thing, new thing, new thing, can't focus. The bot is just, bro, he just if, if you hold the, the controller and point up, he'll just keep walking into the wall like this, yeah. even though he's not going nowhere. Mm. So... I see mistakes all the time. Uh, a lot of them, I think, are personality traits. And then we, I, I look at them and I say, okay, where is this person struggling? Are they struggling with exploration? Are they, are they struggling because they're stuck in a rut? They don't have the guts to basically expand and we move mean. to the potential. Or is it, a, is it a person thing? Is it someone's telling them they can't do this? Mm. Or are they getting in their own way? Mm -hmm. Are they stuck in their own, their own head? And, and, and we do a bespoke advisory service. So at this stage, Latitude Accountants that's doesn't- It's psychological advice. <laughs> it, it is. like, lie down. <laughs> well, that's the power of, that's the power no, of, of like bespoke. It. It's yeah. that it is, we are catering solutions mm -hmm. to individuals. We, we, the hard thing that, I'll be honest with you guys, the hard thing that we face is how we're going to scale this in a way similar to the way you guys run your businesses, mm. okay? So when you run a, an app or you run a platform that can scale really fast, uh, you know, it's not necessarily as bespoke. Mm -hmm. What we do is offer bespoke solutions for people and we're really intimate, right? Mm -hmm. So our vision is to basically help 1,500 business owners achieve their goals and dreams. That's not a huge number. 1,500 yeah. is, you know, fundo in the first month, yeah. you know what I mean? Or, or a business, like it's, it's, it's not that, that volume, yeah, first week, right? Mm -hmm. So, so for us, it's like, okay, we're going to help, we're going to help those, those people grow to, go to a certain level but the level of intimacy mm. where we're gonna really need to learn and where my growth mindset has to come in the next 10 years is how do we scale that without losing that bespoke flavor and how do you do that that's uh, obviously uh, something you haven't worked out yet yeah, yeah. 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 We're, we're, what we're is, working what is on the it. pathway yeah, yeah. It, it sounds like it's just scale headcount man it is headcount is a big one for us so we're ramping up to do a big intake of juniors next year um uh, part of what we're doing with the marketing and, and, and all that, like you see me starting to pop up, we, we didn't, weren't even thinking about marketing space and things like that. I, if I'm being honest with you, the marketing helps with growing the clients, but we've had a lot of clients and we've got a lot of clients and we've got a lot of referrals and networks and, and that's always grown organically. Sure. What I find most attractive about the marketing is this is the way we're going to get accountant bums on seats. Mm -hmm. So we want accountants to see what we're doing in the marketplace and want to work for Latitude Accountants. Is, is there a shortage of accountants? Yes. Like, oh, right, okay. There's oh, a yeah. huge of good, of good, good accountants. Good accountants yeah. is a shortage. Um, and to be honest, man, our secret source is that all our accountants aren't your typical accountants. Like if you meet the guys and girls in my team and they walk in without a Latitude shirt, no one says you're an accountant. Mm. Do you know what I mean? You get builder, drug dealer, <laughs> X, Y, Z. Do you know what I mean? Drug a power lifter. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get accountants. So we do want to build a team of accountants that have people skills yeah. and aren't your generic like number crunches. Um, and we want to get them before our competitors get them. So mm -hmm. the marketing push or well, some of the re one of the reasons I'm here on the podcast, we're putting our name out there is like we want for us to do the vision, we need we need to scale with headcount. And I and I hear what people say in the tech space and say like and, and something you often say is like 
it's sometimes it's easier to just grow in in headcount than to try automate. Like, who's got the money to to do that? It's impossible. So we just need more and more people. It's a startup hack. Yeah, um, you actually sent it to me. Startup hack is do everything manually and then automate after. Yeah. So just try and push it as far, and then only once things start breaking down, it's like okay, now we need systems, SOPs. We need some sort of CRM that better tracks all this stuff. Have you have you started developing your yeah, systems? Yeah, we, we, we've we've done a lot with the systems. We took advantage of uh, of a tax uh, break that came in two years ago. That you know, basically, information technology spend extra twenty percent deduction. We've upped all our software spend. We've spent a lot of money. What are you referring to? That um, was it specifically for accountants? For no, for everyone. Oh, yeah, no, no. It was it was it was about eighteen months ago. There there was a, something called the um, technology boost that came out where where you could claim an extra twenty percent deduction on your on your IT spend. But I think it was capped at a certain limit, which probably wouldn't benefit you guys. I think it was like a twenty grand or something. So it wasn't a huge amount. Okay. But we pushed in. Bish spends it in a day. Yeah, yeah. So it's not, <laughs> a, it's not it's not at the scale that you guys are probably after. But you know, from a lot of businesses that were behind in the tech side, they're like, you yeah, haven't started. If you, you haven't started, started you know what I mean? Twenty grand's twenty grand. 100%. So, so um, we're pushing with all that. Um, we are ahead of most accountants because they come across and I see where they're at. Um, and we're small enough to be able to pivot and do things quicker than your traditional bigger firms. Um, and look, it's culture too. Like the culture we've got. Um, is what's making it attractive, like rocking up to work, working with people you want to work with, they're real yeah. people. Um, and then we're trying to teach them to connect with business owners on a real person level mm. because you don't want to be working with like just a straighty 180 boring bot accountant Here's that's just best. like this. Please sign it. Here's your thing. Please yeah. Sign. Yeah, because you're talking about like two, like just before we covered off the structure side of things, we're yeah. also covering the what's blocking your, you know, these business owners from going to the next level. And I've never had a chat with an accountant that said to me, oh, you know, maybe you're not exploring enough or maybe you're not doing that enough. So to be able to have that sort of, and it's just extra set of eyes, you know, extra, yeah. Yeah, an, an extra opinion, yeah. just a bit of advice saying, hey, you know, maybe you're too stuck in your ways, you need to try something new, or maybe you are being too whiny, you're a weakling, right? Yeah, so yeah. that's, <laughs> exactly. and that's good. And that's sometimes that's all someone needs, just a little kick in the butt. And when you know, I started in accounting, I didn't exactly know what I wanted to do, but I did know one thing, it's that. Again, I was looking for the information. Maybe I was being a baby and I was young. I had a maturity. I was like, I need to know what every business makes in dollars. Mm. So when I work out which one makes the most money, I can go do that. Yeah, you know I mean? that's <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I went out and set out to be an accountant, apart from the fact that someone we knew had a brand new car in the area, mm -hmm. which no one had. Uh, and then I thought, okay, I got to do that. But there's a truth in that. It's like I do get to look. Look, I want to tell you guys a secret. It's a bit of a naughty thing I did. There's Turn off the cameras. Cafe. Turn off the cameras. There's, <laughs> there's a cafe. There's a cafe, I've got a lot of cafes, so don't worry. There's one cafe that um, I go to, which isn't a client, that sells really good sourdough bread. Mm -hmm. And they charge you like 15, 18 bucks for the for the bag of bread and whatever. And the accountant in me is like, bro, 18 bucks is a lot for a bag of bread. I went to another client who also used the same bread. I jumped into their zero file and I looked up their suppliers and I found where they're getting the bread from. So now I can buy my the bread for myself at cost price. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> That's smart. <laughs> it's something I plan to do. I haven't done yeah. it yet, but I know we can do it, right? No, but there is I'll tell you that story to say this is that like we genuinely have access to so much data on so many businesses in real time. Now, when you're sitting with an accountant, you're potentially sitting across from someone that's seen your particular business, unless you're fully like you know, I know you guys are in a very innovative space, but everyday business owners are sitting across from someone that's literally seen behind under the hood of other businesses in your space, maybe a dozen, maybe 50, okay. maybe a hundred times. Yeah. It's very obvious to me when I look at a, a, someone's books and go, man, your gross margin's wrong. Or you're an e-com business, your ad spend is, is wrong. Like your return on ad spend is ridiculous. You know what I mean? Your average order value is not like, I can look at the numbers and go, I'm not an expert in marketing, but I've seen this enough and I know patterns to say you're doing something wrong. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So people don't milk that benefit enough. And because accountants, accountants are notoriously boring and introverted and they sit like this when you talk to them, you're not encouraged, you're not thinking there's a wealth of knowledge there where like I can pick this guy's brain. You know what I mean? So. Pick their brain, get on their phone. The people who benefit the most from their accountant are the one who's got them on speed dial and calling them before they go to the auction, before they make the big acquisition, before they hire that that key personnel, it's like have the discussion, you're going to get the most value that way. You are the sum of all the questions you ask in life. So just ask lots of questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's our uh, 
That's our one hour mark. It's been a pleasure having you on. Thanks so much. Can you look at the camera and give final, oh, look at that camera and give final piece of advice and, uh, you know, an outro? Yeah. Okay, guys. So, um, you can find us at Latitude Accountants on Instagram, www.latitudeaccountants.com.au. Jump on our website. Uh, my advice to you is don't be a weakling, wanker, baby or bot. <laughs> <laughs> and guys, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a minefield going through taxes, uh, managing your liabilities, figuring out how to scale, grow, which levers you have to pull, um, and using people uh, that have the experience like John here um, so that you can you can have a sounding board, someone you can speak to that's been there before, uh, is exactly what you need in life, is exactly what you need to be successful. Uh, so ask lots of questions, call them, you know, when, when, I, when I'm confused or trying to figure out what I'm gonna do, I can name five people I immediately always call, bank one after the other, get their opinion, get their opinion. But the point is, ask lots of questions. Um, I hope you've got uh, some value, uh, some ways to uh, increase or decrease, excuse me, your tax bill. Like, share and subscribe. Please leave a notification bell, ticket or whatever you do. We're on TikTok, we're on YouTube, we're on Instagram. Stay tuned for more on the MVP podcast. Thank you very much.